So how's it going everybody? <laughs> Good news everyone! I've managed to borrow a 2990 WX. This is actually from ASRock. ASRock sent me a 2990 WX so I could help test a few things, help test a few things on Linux because ASRock is pretty keen on supporting Linux. So big thank you to ASRock for loaning me a 2990 WX so that I'll be able to put Linux through its testing. And I've been doing the testing on the Fatality ASRock X399 Gaming. I did a full review of that. That's a Gen 1, you know, Threadripper motherboard, but Gen 1 Threadripper motherboards will work with the new processors. Even the 250 watt monster. Yeah, guess what? It still works fine. So ASRock is not, as far as I know, planning to update this or the Tai Chi. I never got a chance to test the Tai Chi but my favorite thing about this motherboard is that it has built-in 10 gigabit Aquantia NIC. And it's otherwise a, a pretty high-end um, motherboard. I mean, 60 amp MOS situation. I have already, I'll confess, I've already had the 2990 in for preliminary testing because there were some other things that I wanted to check on in terms of benchmarking for the, uh, the other, in terms of like other stuff on the internet. So I am a little late to the Threadripper party. You're gonna have to look over me. I should have the 2950X sometime after the end of August, sometime after August 31st. So I don't, depending on when this video comes out, I'm not real sure, but I did wanna do an early video to say, if you were thinking about the 2990 and you were leaning toward the X399 gaming fatality and you weren't sure, yeah, it works fine. You will need to use it in a case that has a lot of airflow. This guy, when he's allowed to really stretch his legs, is gonna use 400, 500 watts. Now, with the TDP, the default TDP settings on this CPU, 250 watts means that you're gonna be running three gigahertz to 3.4 gigahertz, all core, all of my testing, almost all of my testing so far has been done under Linux. So three to 3.4 gigahertz, all core, isn't bad. And 4.2 gigahertz, honestly, you're gonna see that on more cores than you might think that you would just in terms of power delivery requirements heat management that sort of thing so for cpu coolers so far i've tested the deep cool Fryzen, which is i mean some people think the name Fryzen, like fry ryzen it's an unfortunate name but that's fine it's for ryzen it's Fryzen. i don't know it's fine it's a tower cooler i don't have the cooler master tower cooler to test it but I do have the Gen 1 and the Gen 2 Intermax TR4 coolers. Now I know what you're thinking. Oh, you can't, the Intermax TR4 cooler had major problems, blah, blah, blah. Eh, there was a minor manufacturing defect in uh, some TR4 coolers from Intermax, but under warranty, you can get it replaced. So if you bought a TR4 cooler and you think that maybe it's not performing like it should, you can check it out and see if it's gotten clogged up or the fluid's not flowing like it should. And Intermax will replace that first gen TR cooler with a replacement under warranty or whatever. But there's a new version of that out that really is just some minor tweaks with that and a slightly different fan configuration. But that's a 360 millimeter radiator in both configurations that I have. And so we're gonna test that with this to see what sort of insanity we can get into. Maybe upgrade the dev station. That's what I'm thinking about. Also, I'm really curious, what are your workloads or what are your proposed workloads? So let's talk for a second about, since I didn't get it early and I could do my own benchmarks, let's talk about the top two benchmark sources in my mind on the internet. And that's uh, Ian Kutris's stuff from Anantech. Just his benchmarking automation skills are second to none. And I've tried to replicate some of that automation and it turns out that's actually fairly pesky to do, even with auto hotkey. Like the level of automation that I'm used to for the automation stuff that I use that's more on the Linux side, more like the Pharonix tools, is a little bit, um, let's say, more repeatable. And with auto hotkey and scripts and PowerShell, it's not nearly as repeatable. So good job, Ian Kutris, on your benchmarks and all that kind of stuff. And the, this, the, this, it's awesome. So looking at the benchmarks on Anantech, showing that the 2990 will regress sometimes compared to the 2950. I think we can fix that. I'll talk about that in a minute. And that's mostly on Windows. So there's also the Pharonix test suite. And the Pharonix test suite comparison between Windows and Linux, I did a deep dive on that. And the Pharonix, you know, the Pharonix test suite, Michael Larabelle, very good, very awesome, 
great to have the tool or better to have the tool than, than not have a tool. But in some of the benchmarks, it seemed like when I was trying to run it, now maybe I'm doing something wrong, I don't know. But when I was trying to run it, it seemed like for things like 7-zip, it's using a different version of the 7-zip binary on Windows than like a pre-compiled Windows binary. Because I mean, Windows, it doesn't expect you to compile stuff versus Linux. And so I wonder if some of the advantage there uh, on Windows versus Linux is not so much scheduler related as related to old binaries. I'm diving into that, but I don't have that yet. But if anybody has any specific insights into that, let me know. I also ran into some like trying to replicate things like John the Ripper. I'm using Fedora, and so like libssl is a problem trying to run John the Ripper benchmarks on Fedora because even though I have the develop versions installed, it doesn't think they're installed, and I don't know what else I need. And there's a couple other benchmarks in the benchmark test suite that I would try to run to compare apples to apples and running into problems there. But this video is mainly about uh, what I can tell you about this and that and also error correcting memory. So this is, this is like, this is, this is a glorified vlog. I'm sorry, but this is all I've got right now. This is crucial memory. So I'm working on an insane build, maybe with 128 gigs of memory. Now, most people don't need ECC memory. So I'm gonna have 128 gigs of non-ECC memory and 128 gigs of ECC memory. The ECC memory that I picked up is from Crucial. It's 2666. This is the fastest, as far as I know, error correcting memory that you can get on the market. And it's based on Micron chips, because I didn't really, well, there were other choices, but I really wanted Micron, Samsung, something like that. 2666 error correcting, 1.2 volts. The timings on this kit are um, a bit loose. They're uh, by default at 2666, it's 20, 19, 19, 19, 39. However, at 1.35 volts, everything runs fine with 15, 15, 15, don't quote me on this, but I think 32. Um, I'm gonna save a screenshot of the BIOS from the X399 Fatality, and we can use that in the video and, and see what we're doing. So, error correcting memory. Now, did you verify that error correction is actually correcting errors? Yes, yes, error correcting is actually correcting errors. The error correction code in the Linux kernel is there. And also the hardware notification for single bit errors and dual bit catastrophic failure if that region of memory is in use. All of that is in place. The one bug that exists has to do with secure encrypted virtualization, SEV. So this is another gotcha or thing or just a post-it note to remember when you're dealing with Threadripper. The new Agiza update on Threadripper 2.0 1.1.0 point stuff or 1.1 point something point something. That's the new one. It's, I think it's not out for every board yet, but it is available in version three and beyond. 3.3 is what I used for testing on the X399 so far. That version of the Agiza is problematic with newer versions of the Linux kernel. And that has to do with platform security code. This is, this is bad because this is the kind of thing that makes Linus Torvald's blood pressure really high because you don't break user land. And so what happened was changes were accepted into the kernel before there was a corresponding Agiza update. And there is a bug in the module and or a bug in the Agiza that tries to enable the SEV, Secure Encrypted Virtualization, I think, extensions on Threadripper when really that's an epic, epic CPU feature. And so that kernel module just hangs and crashes the system and it's really bad. So if you are trying to get Threadripper up and running and you're losing your mind, it's that platform security processor. That's the problem. And we're gonna talk more about that on the Linux channel. There's a bunch of forum threads about it. We've got a bunch of people fixed up on our forum, helping them recompile their kernel, helping them roll back the kernel version. We've, 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 we've already helped dozens of people. So if you're in that boat, sorry, working on it. There's a, there's a bug for it on Red Hat. I think there's a thread for it on Gigabyte's forums. I think everybody's forums, you know, ASRock, I think everybody I think has got this. If your BIOS has the option to disable SEV, you should be okay because the, the BIOS on this ASRock board is advertising support for SEV, but it's not actually a thing on Threadripper CPU. So you have to disable it. And you can compile the kernel with PSP support set to no, and I would have thought that most of the distro maintainers would have updated their kernels by now because it's been kind of a problem for like a month since, well, since August, I th well, that, that Giza update hit July 25th. And we're just now starting to get 
newer kernels and some of these bleeding edge distros and it's not fixed. And so this could have been avoided. And this is exactly the kind of thing that Linus Torvalds loses his mind over. So fair warning. But um, I think that we can probably fix it in BIOS by having SCV disabled by default because I don't think that should be a thing on Threadripper anyway. Although I think some people did report getting the encrypted memory working with older versions of the Agiza on Threadripper. So I don't know what to make about that. So if you know about that or you have any experience or you want to share the, the output of your logs, uh, come to the level one forums and clue me in because I don't have time to do everything and <laughs> I could use more lieutenants in this vastly complicated array of insanity and terrible and craziness and whatever. So the last thing I wanted to talk about for the Windows people, process lasso. So let's talk about Numa nodes and, and whatever. Yeah, Numa nodes, is that like horny toads? No, it's not. No, I don't even know why I said that. <sighs> On the 1950X, you know, it's two dies. Like, you know, we, I mean, you probably watch like 75 videos. So it's like inside this package, there's four pieces of silicon plus the interposer that's connect, connecting them all together. And so you got, you know, a, on the first gen, you got a dummy die and a dummy die and like a real die and a real die. And we don't know which ones are which. And so eight core and eight core, 16 core CPU, 2990, all of these are hooked up. But two of them are not connected to memory or the bus, the PCI Express bus. So here's the output of LS Topo. List, list your topography, your CPU topography. This is a fun exercise for your Linux users. Um, this is a, a visualization of the physical topology of the CPU. And even if you don't use Linux, this is a good idea to understand what you're up against here on Windows. On the 1950 and the 2950, you can tell the CPU if, you, if it should present itself to the operating system as one unified CPU or two NUMA nodes. And so in the picture here, we've got four NUMA nodes and we can see that two of the NUMA nodes have 16 gigabytes of memory associated with them and also have um, the PCI Express bus peripherals associated with them. Some PCI Express bus peripherals are associated with one node and some PCI Express peripherals are associated with another node. And that explains some performance weirdness on first generation Threadripper that I didn't really get to talk directly about, but if you follow the videos, I definitely did get to talk about it. So these NUMA nodes, looking at this, you can see that two NUMA nodes are not directly connected to memory at all. So there are four NUMA nodes in this system. This is non-uniform memory access NUMA. And the other mode is uniform memory access UMA. So it tells Windows that, hey, I can get to this memory just as easy as that memory, which is technically a lie. It's a little bit more latency for this, like this CPU has two channels of memory associated with it. And this CPU over here has two channels of memory associated with it. And so if this CPU needs that CPU's memory, that's a little bit worse of a situation than the CPU being able to get whatever it needs from the memory that's directly connected to it. But it's not as bad as a dual socket system. So like if you have two CPUs in a system, it's the same situation. Some memories associated with one physical CPU, some memories associated with the other physical CPU. The penalty for accessing memory not on your socket is much worse in that situation than the Infinity Fabric situation. So it's not really wrong that, that AMD did what they did. Just some, some programs actually perform better being told that there's just one node and some programs perform worse. And so that's why a little bit, there's a little bit of a regression with the 2990 because the only option with the 2990 because we're talking about four nodes and two of them don't have any access to memory is to run it as a four node setup it doesn't matter how else you set it up because there's no memory physically connected to those two nodes so enter process lasso process lasso if you don't know about it is a really awesome program for windows and actually even helped performance on the 1950x so we did testing with like gta 5 and if you look back at this ls topo you can see all these pci express devices on one side our graphics card is associated with one ryzen die or the other ryzen die and so if we can get gta 5 and our gtx 1080 pci express device and you know all of that stuff running on that that one numa node then we're gonna have much better performance from that game because the game doesn't really use more than eight cores anyway a Windows scheduler is not necessarily smart enough to figure all that out. Well, Process Lasso is. And Process Lasso, strictly speaking, right now, does not have support for NUMA nodes. But I reached out to their support and I've been having the conversation with them about this and they're gonna add some support. They're gonna, we're gonna, we're gonna do an experiment with the Process Lasso folks. And I don't know how that's gonna turn out. 
But we're gonna do it, and that's in the pipeline, and that's another thing that I've been working on, just so that you know that I've been busy. So that's where I am with the Threadripper 2990WX. And I would be farther along, but I only got the 2990WX a few days ago, and I've been kind of busy otherwise, so sorry about that. But hopefully this video will tide you over and let you know what I'm thinking and what I'm working on. And if you have workloads that you legit think would run well with 32 cores, DevOps workloads, or you wanna give me some Docker Compose files or some you know unit tests or anything like that that I can show off in a video for your workload in kind of an automated way, that would be good. I'm gonna show off the Ferronix test suite, which again is, is really awesome for automated testing, although not super consistent results. My testing on the 2990 has been a bit slower, at least with the 250 watt TDP, than what Ferronix has reported. And I'm not sure if that's because I'm on Fedora or what. So I'm gonna set up a, an Ubuntu 18.04 system and see if that solves my John the Ripper problem and my libssl problem and all that. So that's what's on my to-do list. I just haven't gotten there yet. So yeah, if you wanna chat about all this or share pictures or have any ideas or whatever, come to the level one forums. I'm Wendell, I'm signing out and I'll see you there. Also, whoo, boy howdy. The part number for this crucial kit is in the description and hopefully is an affiliate link so we make a few bucks if you buy some. Yeah, this works fine in 128 gig configuration. Oh, one note, one other note. Almost forgot, this is kind of important. So if you are gonna run a crazy amount of memory, so if you're gonna run, if you're gonna run 128 gigs of memory with Threadripper, you're gonna have eight sticks of 16 gigabytes, probably. And so 2666 doesn't really slow you down because the more memory you add in the more ranks, the slower the memory needs to go. But the memory can be interleaved, so you get some speed. So like while one row of chips on one stick of memory is busy, you can be doing stuff with another row of chips. And so if you interleave it just the right way, having that higher density memory makes it a little bit faster. So even though the memory's clocked slower, it doesn't hurt your performance as much as you think that it would. And so here's some preliminary benchmarks from the Ferronix test suite with uh, G-Skill Flare X 3200 at 3200 versus the crucial 64 gig kit. So 64 gigs versus 32 gig. The 32 gig kit is a perfect case scenario with Threadripper. It's eight gigs per stick, single rank, really fast, 3200 versus 2666. Yeah, some things are gonna be a little bit slower, but not dramatically slower. So not really a big deal. And 128 gigs, basically 2666 continues to work as normal. So no big deal.